Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. I'm Julie Hedrick. I'm the APFA National President. Before we get started here today, I'm going to have everyone introduce themselves who are in the room and will be answering questions. Jim? Hi, I'm Timothy Lagueros, a negotiator based in Miami. Hi, Susan Roble, based in Chicago. Hello, I'm Brian Morgan, based in Philadelphia. Hi, I'm Kelly Hagan, based in Chicago. Hi, I'm Wendy Oswald, based in LAX. Hi, I'm Reese Cole, based in Chicago. Okay, great. All right, now that you've met the team, oh, hang on, we've got one more person with us here who will be um, live with us, but he is virtual today. Joey, you want to introduce yourself? Uh, hey, everybody, I'm Joe Burns. I'm the negotiating attorney working with uh, your bargaining committee. I'm also the general counsel of uh, AFA and have 20 years of bargaining experience in the airline industry. Thank you, Joe. All right, today we wanted to get, continue to provide you with as much information as possible about what's going on at the negotiating table. Hopefully you've been keeping up through the hotlines and also with our website um, to see exactly what we are negotiating for you. Um, today, we have a lot of questions that have been asked. We will get to those um, after a few um, other details that we'd like to um, talk about where we're at um, in the negotiation process. We do want to remind all of you to make sure that you're always wearing your union pin when you go to work. Also, the red lanyards, if you don't have one, um, we have plenty of red lanyards for everyone. So please make sure to get one of those from either a contract action team member or from one of your base presidents. Um, we're going to start out today with Joe. He is going to talk a little bit about the Section 6 process and a few other things. So I'm going to turn it over to Joe now. And Joe, if you want to start out with uh, where we're at in the process. OK, um, hey, everybody, I'm just going to give you a little bit of overview of the Railway Labor Act, uh, which is the law that governs our bargaining in the airline industry. It also governs uh, rail workers as well. And then um, talk a little bit about where we're at in the process. So under the Railway Labor Act, we call it Section 6 bargaining because it's Section 6 of the Railway Labor Act. Um, it provides that the union and the company can engage in direct negotiations. That means that they're negotiating uh, with each other uh, without the federal government being involved at that point. Um, and uh, and that's where we're at, at in the process. We've been meeting directly with the company, um, working through almost all of the sections and we're, people will tell you where we're at in terms of the economics, but we're going to be getting to that pretty soon. Um, at a certain point in bargaining, when when uh, either party feels it would be helpful and useful to use move the process forward, um, either party can file for mediation uh, with the National Mediation Board. You ask the federal government to uh, become involved in your bargaining, and at that point, they assign a federal mediator, and the mediator determines the place and timing of the negotiations. Um, we don't file for mediation too early because if we do, then we have another person's schedule that we have to deal with and it can slow down negotiations. Um, but at a certain point, uh, you want to get into mediation uh, for the reasons that I'll specify uh, uh, next. Um, we are at the point where we're um, very, very close to filing for mediation uh, to move the process forward. So once you file for mediation, the mediation board will uh, convene mediation sessions. The mediator has no power to force an agreement to make any party agree to anything, um, but they do uh, have some control over the, the process. Um, at a certain point, when you reach a point where you're just passing proposals, there's no agreement, you've talked about everything, you've talked about economics, uh, then at that point, uh, the union or the company can request that the National Mediation Board release us into a 30 day cooling off period. The way they do that is called a proffer of arbitration. They basically offer arbitration to either side. Um, and, uh, and if either side rejects it, then uh, you enter a 30 day cooling off period. You go through the 30 day cooling off period, you have more intense bargaining. And then at the end of that, you're finally 
uh, able to engage in self-help, which for the union means a strike. For the company, it could mean a lockout. The union can use other forms of economic pressure as well. So that's kind of the, the overview of the Railway Labor Act. You know, the other piece of it is that um, throughout this process, uh, at a certain point, the union uh, can determine to take a strike vote. Um, and that is one, a necessary part of the process if we're going to request a release to strike, um, but it also has a lot of other benefits in terms of raising the profile of the disputes and so forth. And you, you all may have followed the news where uh, various unions uh, uh, use that uh, to help pressure the company and to demonstrate resolve and so forth. Um, the timing of that, um, you know, is typically that would be up to the union, um, but you know, typically you want to have the issues fairly clarified. So you'd want the economics on the table because if people are voting uh, to strike, they want to be able to know what they're, what and why they're uh, voting the strike. Um, so that that's the that's the overall legal legal framework. As I've said, we're we're getting to crunch time. Uh, we are at the point where we've gone through all of the sections except for the economic sections. Um, your committee, you know, in the next, uh, you know, I anticipate will be winding up scheduling in reserve and we'll be putting an economic proposal on the table that will include expenses, the compensation section, the expense section, and the benefit section. Um, and then we have all the priorities and outstanding issues that we'll be fighting for as well um, as, as we move into the end game of bargaining. Um, I, just a couple more words uh, about this uh, that I think is important. Um, I, I've been doing this a long time and you know, you reach a point in negotiations where, you know, we're putting out the updates, everyone's, you know, getting involved, they're paying attention. And there's a tendency for individuals to say, hey, this is going too slow. Why don't we, you know, do a, you know, slow down? Why don't we do uh, various types of actions, refuse to pick up open time, all this stuff to put pressure on the company? Um, there's two problems with that. Um, one is that it, um, it sets both the individuals and the company up for retribution. Um, so uh, under the Railway Labor Act, that's considered self-help. And if you do it um, too early in the process before you've been released, even though you wouldn't think that it should be self-help, but it is, um, uh, the company can rule it in illegal strike. They can go into court and get an injunction. When they do that, it gives them a tremendous amount of leverage against the union. They did that against the TWU here with the uh, mechanics recently, a few years ago, um, based on a fairly innocuous uh, uh, post up in one of the one of the crew, one of the break rooms. Um, but they were able to parlay that into getting an injunction and getting leverage over the union. They've done it with Americans. Americans aggressive with it. They did it with the 20 million judgment against the pilots. Um, but it certainly happens all throughout the industry and it becomes a distraction to our bargaining. The other problem with it is um, it, it can set up the individuals for discipline and even termination. Um, you know, we obviously will would and will fight, but I've had other carriers to put a lot of effort into getting folks back to work. So the, the bottom line with it is we want to fight the company, but we want to fight smart. So we don't want these sort of side actions and distractions. Um, we want to, you know, we, we don't want to be kind of, you know, trying to go in through the side door when we've got a we've got a proven strategy where we can get out there, we can pick it, we can do whatever we up to and including a strike vote to put pressure on the company and reach an agreement. So let's stick to the script here. And if you hear about it, contact your union officers and your negotiating committee so they can, uh, you know, have our uh, uh, legal team and your officers address it. OK, so uh, I think that uh, um, covers. I think there was one more question that's kind of come in and, you know, from time to time people say, well, this is going so long. Is the company really bargaining in good faith? And the, the reality is at the table, we're, we're exchanging proposals back and forth. We don't like, you know, a lot of their proposals that come back, but on the other time side, we are reaching agreement. Um, they are, you know, sort of responding to our discussion points. 
Um, so, you know, the, the term uh, bad faith bargaining is a pretty defined legal one, and I've been involved in bad faith bargaining, and it, it looks a lot different than what we uh, see here. Part of the problem is the Railway Labor Act, as I just indicated, has this extended process which benefits the employer, but, you know, that's why we're doing our picketing. That's why we're doing the wearing, you know, show of support, wearing your buttons and stuff, because your actions... That, that's how we push forward negotiations. Okay, that's that's enough. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Joe. Um, okay, on hang on, you're not off the hook yet. Um, so, Joe, I just I think we bet we should probably remind um, the members that this is targeted negotiations, and you want to talk about a little bit about um, the negotiations that we are doing and why we did targeted negotiations. Yeah, so I mean, as you can see with this process with the Railway Labor Act, it's kind of set up to, you know, have these protracted negotiations. And who does that benefit? You know, overall, obviously, it, it benefits the company because we're the ones who want improvements. We're fighting for wage increases and so forth. So left to, you know, its own devices, if you just if you don't bargain strategically, you can end up bargaining for years and years and years, you know, so, you know, like five years. Um, I, you know, I've seen bargaining go on that long and all the time you're, you, you start falling behind the industry and so forth and management's able to just stonewall. So we, uh, you know, I think when we, uh, you know, did our reset of bargaining uh, a year, year and a half ago or so, you know, we said we're going to we're going to do a strategic bargaining approach. And that means targeted negotiations. It doesn't mean that we don't bring forward uh, important issues. In fact, it's the opposite. We bring forward kind of the key issues of concerns to flight attendants. We get those on the table and we push the process forward. What we don't do is, you know, try and negotiate every little single word in the contract because that gives management the opportunity to delay it. Um, at this point, um, you know, our, except for our economic proposals, all the other sections are on the table. So we have a finite list of items and it's posted on the website. It's been available. You know, there's a transparency approach to bargaining. So, so those are what we're proposing at this point. We're not adding new proposals. We don't have the ability to add new proposals on, on those issues. Um, we're going to be fighting for those priorities. Okay, great. So, thanks, Joe. I think um, the last thing I'm going to ask you to talk about right now is um, we're approaching the economics. We're getting a lot of questions about retroactive pay, signing bonuses. Um, I, I think if we can just give an overall overview of basically economics and kind of how that works here um, with this negotiations. Yeah, so we're, I mean, we're at the point where we've agreed to uh, uh, you know, a lot of items in the various sections, but we've carried over items we weren't able to agree with. Um, and many of those, uh, you know, have an economic impact. Um, if we want more vacation pay uh, or credit or sick leave and so forth, um, that both costs the money and it could impact that they need to hire more uh, flight attendants overall. Um, we have work rule changes that we're requesting that, you know, that that, you know, the company will cost out and, and put a value to. Now, our overall approach is we're fighting for our demands and the company has money and they need to pay for it. But nonetheless, it, it, it is an economic battle at that point. Um, we have our uh, Dan Akins, who's our longstanding air, uh, union side uh, airline financial analyst, uh, who is working with the committee. He has a long history of working with uh, properties he, uh, that came together to uh, form this carrier. Um, so he has uh, you know a couple decades of experience uh, dealing with this. Uh, he'll be uh, sort of advising the committee and helping you know look at industry comparisons, but also uh, costing out the company's proposals. Um, but basically, you know, I think the company's perspective is they'll they'll lump everything together and say you know how much more this is going to cost. Um, we also do that analysis. Um, but at the end of the day, it becomes a fight over pressure, right? That's why we talk about the contract action team and so forth, because there's a limit to what our words can do to uh, get the company to uh, agree to things. It's going to take some pressure to, for them to put more money into the agreement. 
So when we talk about more money, you know, we're talking a carry this size, you know, tens or hundreds of millions of dollars. So it's 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 fairly big uh, dollars that we're fighting for. Um, one of the issues that will come up in the economics is um, issues of retro pay and signing bonus. Um, those are like any other economic item. They have a value attached to them. Um, it's a question of, you know, uh, fighting to get it. Um, you know, I, you know, I'm certain it'll be on the list of demands for the committee and it'll be one of the, probably one of the last items that we uh, settle. Um, and I, just to close this out, you know, what we're able to get ultimately is going to be determined by the membership, by, by you all getting folks out there on the uh, on the picket line on pressuring the company on responding on 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 showing the company visibly that folks are behind the negotiating committee that's what's going to force them to put more economics including these uh, issues on the table thank you joe um, you may have to do the whole town hall. We just realized our Wi-Fi is not working very well in the building today. So they, I hopefully all of our uh, members can hear you fine. Um, we're struggling a little bit here. So um, I think it's the Wi-Fi in our building today. So hopefully, um, please let us know if you're struggling to hear um, the committee uh, so that we can uh, see if we can make some adjustments here. Um, thanks, Joe, for all of that. Um, I'm going to have Joe, uh, Josh go to the website because um, we just kind of want to review quickly with everybody where all this information is on our new website. And uh, let's see if we can get there, Josh. Maybe not. I think it's going. Well, it's, we're not the only ones having problems today as everybody knows the company's having issues also at noon when our bids came out uh i'm still struggling excuse me the union has been in touch with the company today um not happy uh that this is happening again uh and uh working on you know figuring out what the actual issue is uh but we're having our own issues so um it doesn't look like we're going to be able to get onto our website hopefully you guys can all hear us um, we'll watch for any remarks that uh, that may come in. Do you think that will help? Okay, we're going to leave really quick. We'll come right back in and hope that that will help with our signal here so you can hear us better. Okay, great. All right, do we want to try and attempt to go to the website one more time? Yep. All right, let's try and quickly get there. I don't want to waste time with everybody here. Uh, okay, here we go. We're at our new APFA website. Hopefully all of you have had an opportunity to check it out. There's a lot of information there. Uh, if you go up to the top at the negotiations, uh, you see all the information we have there. The negotiation status page is the page where we have up to date um, the proposals that we are proposing to the company and their responses to us. To date, we have um, 17 sections that have been MTA. We have 13 sections that have been tabled, four sections that are open, and we have six sections that we are yet to open, which all are pretty much economic sections. Um, we're bringing you to the website because we want to make sure that you are keeping up to date, that you actually go there on a regular basis. There is a little asterisk, I believe, when it is something new that is added um, to the website. And so just this is really um, as all of you know, we've never done negotiations like this before at APFA. This is transparent so that we are providing you with as much information as we possibly can um, so that when it does come time that we have a TA, that you have all the information you need to make an informed vote. So um, I think we're good with the website. Let's go back to our questions um, and basically walk into some of the items that we are have been negotiating. Um, we do want to talk about one or two things. Um, this is based on the questions that we're getting. And one is, um, and I've seen this for many years, why do we not just have all professional negotiators? And if you look around the industry, um, the way that we negotiate with a lead professional uh, negotiating attorney is what the majority of all unions do. And then they have members who actually work under that contract, who are those that are working with that attorney 
and um, and helping uh, and obviously negotiating at the table. Um, this is standard across the industry and um, we have Joe Burns. He's done this for many, many years and um, we want to um, just make sure that everybody is aware of that. Also, we wanted to talk about where we're at in comparison to the rest of the industry and um, is everything OK? Yes, yes. Uh -oh. No, it's fine. <laughs> How are you ready to in the room? I feel no, like it's not. That's great. It's very funny. funny. No, oh, OK, fine. sorry. Um, I thought there's something going on. I don't know. Um, but we want to talk about where we're at in comparison to the rest of the industry. Um, as some of you may know, Southwest has been in negotiations throughout COVID. They are in mediation at this time. And um, so they're probably the one flight attendant union who is a pretty much, um, I, I hate to say ahead of us, but also in, in a very similar to where we're at today. Um, United started negotiating after COVID um, later than we did. So they're not quite as far along in their process as we are. As you all know, Delta is not unionized. Um, they do not negotiate for our contract. Obviously, right now, um, the big push at Delta is to get them unionized. Um, APA, they had, that's our pilot union. Um, they were set to send a TA out to their membership about two months ago, and their board decided not to send that TA out to the membership. And uh, for, um, they actually, have a brand new negotiating team now. They replaced their entire negotiating team. The gate agents here at American, they are in negotiations. Uh, they start much later than we did back at the table. As all of you know, we took a break during COVID. Um, that was what pretty much almost everyone in the industry did. Um, nobody was negotiating uh, for their uh, CBAs during that time frame. So I think where we're at in the process is we're in a very good place, um, quite honestly, and we have been moving along um, in this process. All right, before we get started um, on some of the other details, I wanna talk about the transparency. Um, like I said, this is new here. We haven't done this before. I know I've heard from a lot of flight attendants you know, it looks like the company is just rejecting everything that you're putting uh, forward at the table. Um, you're st you have a bird's eye view this time of negotiations. This is really the negotiation process. This is how it works. And so, as Joe said earlier, we are making progress. Um, there are agreements. Um, you'll hear some of those right now, um, but you are seeing how the negotiation process works. So just really wanted to make sure you understood that. All right, Tim, let's get started with um, talking about uh, what we're negotiating versus policy. Yes, yeah, so uh, one of the items that comes up frequently is about the sick policy, the sick the attendance policy, and, and why isn't that contractual? First, you have to understand what is what is contractual and what is policy. Obviously, we are we are looking for contractual improvements. Um, currently, the attendance policy is a policy, much like the non-rev travel agreement that they have that as a policy as well. Um, historically, APFA has fought to keep the attendance policy out of the contract. In addition to that, we also have the fact that it went to arbitration. And so there is a there's an award on that um, to think that the company is going to agree to something more generous than what is already there, even though we don't think it's generous at all, um, is a, a little bit hard to imagine. Um, other Examples of the policy are something like the uh, the upgrades that they do for pass, right? They, they constantly change who can stand by for flight. As much as we hate that, that is something in control of the company currently. Okay, thanks, Tim. All right, Kelly, we've got a lot of questions about reserve. We um, do. Reserve has been one of our biggest priorities here in negotiations this time. So, Kelly, can you talk to about what we're proposing and also some of the improvements and agreements we already have? Yeah, if you don't mind, let's start with rotation because sure. I know that's a real hot topic. Um, and hopefully everybody's catching up with their hotlines, um, but we had stated in a few hotlines ago that we're not entertaining straight reserve nor A days. Um, we are looking at modifying the current rotation. Um, we're not exactly sure what that looks like yet because what we're trying to do is seek what improvements that we can within reserve because that's going to impact like what does a reserve rotation look like. Um, so we don't have any set numbers on that, which is why we haven't opened that subsection of the contract yet. 
Um, but some improvements that we are seeking with reserve is we're looking at raising the 40 hour aggressive um, to 60 hours. So that way, you know, you have a lot more options to go in there and kind of pick what you want. Um, we're also looking for and the company has agreed to clicks for everything. So we're looking at clicks for awards for assignments in both uh, a Rota environment as well as a daily environment. Um, we're also looking at improving our reports so that way you don't have to go from screen to screen to try to figure out OK, what does it look like here? Let me go over here and look. So we're trying to get a little bit more transparency with that. Um, as as well as and Brian will touch on a little bit later on some of like with her. we're also very aware that flex days are very important. That's kind of our balance between work life and non work life. And we're seeing, you know, they're going into flex days. You know, we've got plans, we make doctor's appointments, we have a life. Um, and American kind of sneaks into that other life a little bit. So what we're trying to do is create how trips are processed in 12K2 where you'd be less likely to go into a flex day. Um, we have asked in other sections to limit it. They can only go into so many flex days, but we're also trying to work on the back end process to even limit it before it even gets to that to that part. Um, we also asked to reduce the number of wraps from four down to three. And um, one of the reasons that we're doing that is because we're noticing in like the DRAP, that flight isn't sitting there, but they're not getting used. And we're seeing a lot of the AB wraps, how those are getting used. You're getting used into an earlier wrap or, you know, or the trip's going into an earlier wrap. And we're trying to give a little bit more uh, stability within just three wraps and just taking that fourth one out. Um, a financial incentive that we're looking at is a reserve override. We get a lot of emails like, hey, are you guys going to raise the guarantee? You know, like United's got a higher guarantee. Well, that is true. United does have a higher guarantee, but they also have a much higher obligation for a reserve because they're like reserve kind is 100 hours. Yeah, 100 hours. Let that one sink in. So what we're looking at is not necessarily a reserve guarantee increase, but let's do a reserve override. Let's get, you know, so much money per every reserve hour that you're paid on reserve days. Um, if you do look at our uh, status updates. I'm sure you would have seen that the company wants to discontinue the ability for reserves to drop a reserve trip on ETB. That's a hard no for us. Um, and I saved the best for last, I think, is one of the things that the company has agreed to. We're still uh, working out the finer points is that reserves can now use if this contract gets ratified TTS and UBL on a day off. So you're not just beholden to ETB. You can actually go in there and exercise your seniority and you can go pick up some some pretty cool trips because we're trying to increase access to open time. Uh, so including out of baseline too, which Reese. That's all you go. <laughs> Good stuff. All right, so um, reserve and scheduling are probably the two most important things um, in our daily lives. So I'm going to talk all about scheduling, which is section 10. Um, you can think of scheduling in three broken up pieces. Um, the first, of course, would be PBS. The second would be the daily scheduling systems that we use, uh, TTS, UBL, ETB. And then the third would be rescheduling. So with PBS, um, some improvements that we have already gotten agreed to are that position bidding will be by aircraft within layer. So currently you just position bid um, generally and you can't specify between different aircrafts. And so what we got the company to agree to is that you'll be able to go in and position bid by aircraft. So if you want to work the number one on a triple seven, but don't necessarily want to work it on the seven eight, um, you would be able to specify the difference between those um, without having to go to a separate layer. Um, we also got them to agree to a speaker search criteria for um, in PBS so that you'll be able to bid um, your specific language within a layer. And then for reserves, we uh, got the option for a reserve to be able to bid for a number of days off um, as opposed to bidding specific dates within the calendar. So there'd be an alternative to that. 
Um, we recognize that a lot of uh, with reserve rotation, people are not bidding reserve regularly and they may not be familiar, maybe hard to remember how to bid for reserve. So this is a way to kind of more generally bid for reserve um, and just specify that you want four days off at a time or five days off or you want a whole chunk of your days off together and then the rest of your days off would be um, just the two that are contractually required. So those are the PPS improvements that we've already secured. Um, for TTS, um, our main focus has been to Im uh, improve flexibility by allowing trading between um, sequences. So currently, I'm sure you're all familiar with the 3% daily limit. So today, if there's 3% is at, if, if there is open time at 3% or greater, no other trips will be able to drop on that day. And so even if you're trying to pick up a trip that's at 3% um, from a day that's 3%, you won't be able to drop your trip because your day, your trip is also at 3%. So what we call that is negative days. So when there's more open time than 3%, that day is considered negative. And so our proposal, and the company does seem open to it, but we are still working out the details, is that as long as the trip that you're dropping and the trip that you're picking up are both negative or the trip that you're picking up is more negative than the day that you're dropping, you'll be able to, to swap, you'll be able to trade. So for example, we are all probably pretty familiar with weekends being days that most people don't want to work. And so a lot of times there's more open time on those days. If you are trying to work on the weekend, but you have a weekday trip, you would most likely be able to trade into a weekend trip and drop your weekday trip, even if your weekday trips, they're also at 3%. So, and the idea behind that is just to let people fly what they want to fly. Um, if you're willing to work, we want you to work what you want to work. And that's the focus is to, to allow the trading to go through. Um, for UBL, there's three things that we're focusing on. The first is for um, out of base UBL to be an option. And again, the company does seem open to it. We are still working out the details, but um, it does look like out of base UBL is something that we'll be uh, going forward with, as well as last minute call out UBL. So currently, um, UBL is run before a trip goes to. Uh, reserve processing, but if the trip is open with less than two hours or three hours in a co-terminal, then it immediately has to go to a standby and um, anyone on the UBL doesn't get an option to bid for that sequence. And so the last minute call out would be the ability to access the UBL before it would go to a standby. So of course you would opt in just like you do for the UBL today. You would set the amount of time that you're um, willing to, to come in for it, and you would have an option to that, even though it's less than two hours, three hours co-terminals um, till the departure of that sequence. Um, the last thing is for UBL neutral trades to go through um, until ROTA processing the day before. So currently, once um, the last TTS run has happened, and now we're in UBL, which is the day of or the day before, there is no trading that really happens. And um, we recognize that, you know, it might be the day before your trip is reporting. You see another trip go into open time. You have a trip and you see a trip that's, a, you have a three day trip. You see a three day trip that you'd rather have. Why can't you just, it would only be until uh, ROTA processing the day before. But, um, and again, we're still working out the details, but the company does seem open to that. And again, it's just letting you work the trip that you want to work. Um, finally, we have rescheduling and uh, we got a really big um, agreement with the company here. So um, 10J1B kind of an obscure, uh, obscurely written section of the contract. Um, it pertains to what happens to reschedulings when there's a natural dis disaster or extraordinary circumstances like something like COVID. Um, and all of a sudden, many flight attendants are affected, many sequences are affected, and um, full cancellations are happening, and people are losing bal the balance of their sequence, their uh, award, the PBS award. 
And um, the way the contract is currently written, it's vague and kind of open to interpretation. And so what we were able to agree to with the company is for concise and direct and real definitions for what this section means. Um, it'll be three or more sequences, full cancellations, and it'll allow you to do like sequence TTS bidding. Um, and then you'll be, as long as you participate and you follow the process that's laid out, you'll be um, paid protected for it if you don't get a trip uh, that follows the bid. And um, so this is a huge gain. Um, as you may be aware, we've had large agreements that have had to be negotiated between the union and the company. Those take time. And in the meantime, you're just like, what do I do? I don't know if I'm gonna get paid for these trips or not. Should I pick up time? I don't know. And so this just really cleans up that whole process. Um, and I feel especially proud of what we did here because um, AA was originally open to it, but they wanted to only pay protect after 71 hours. And so if you're a high time flyer, and you lost sequences due to some sort of extraordinary circumstance, you were still only going to be pay protected for 71. So even if your award was 100 plus hours, you would only be pay protected to 71. And um, this, they, we, we were able to get them to agree to the individual full sequence pay protection, which is huge. Um, and then finally, one other thing that we have nearly gotten to an agreement to, or for maybe a few words apart still, is um, for some of our uh, pay penalty stuff that's coming in related to like scheduling miss awards and um, crew scheduling errors. So um, currently there is a miss award process in place, but it's not contractualized and we are putting it into the contract and nearly there in getting that all agreed to. So um, that's it for scheduling. Thank you, Reese. That was very good. Uh, that was a lot. A lot. Yes. I want to go back on one thing, though. Um, let's go back to reserve just for a second, because um, I know Kelly started out with reserve rotation, and we just want to make sure everybody, because we know this is what we've heard quite a bit about the reserve seniority and how high the reserve seniority is. And so we want to make sure our members know that um, this is really a priority to us to figure out how to lower the reserve seniority. But also we want the members to know that whatever we decide and whatever goes on in the agreement, that it will be for those that are not on the property, um, that everyone on the property would be grandfathered. And so we, this is especially difficult um, to say the least. It's a very, um, you know, there's a lot of different thoughts out there about reserve, um, but we pretty consistent um, across um, all bases is that the seniority of reserve has to be lowered. So just want to make sure um, the members know that is definitely a priority for us. And um, yet also we want to make sure that whatever it is that we put out to the membership that is livable um, for all our members. So I just want to make sure um, that was that was in there. All right, we're going to move on to hours of service and Tim's going to talk about that. Okay. Yes, so in hours of service, we are proposing several changes um, to both the duty rigs, um, as well as post change to the standby time. Uh, the importance of duty rigs, in case just a little refresher, you know, we're, we're all paid the greater of the flight time, a minimum five hours uh, multiplied by the number of duty periods, the duty time or the trip rig. And why these are important is that that, that amounts for a minimum of pay. So let's take the duty duty day, for example. A 12 hour duty day, you know you're going to get one hour of one minute of pay for every two minutes on duty. So the longer the duty day, we want to make sure that we have a minimum of pay, right? So if you have a 10 hour day, it's going to be paid five hours. If that 10 hour day ends up being 12 hours, you know that that rig is running in the background. That's all it's going to get you that extra hour pay to bring you up to six hours. Most of the time, the flight time pay is what we see as being the greatest. Um, but to be clear, there is a duty rig that's running from the time we sign in until the end of your debrief, which basically comes to half of our hourly rate of pay. So we are paid from sign in till the end of debrief, guaranteed half our hourly rate of pay. What a lot of people want, most of us feel that we deserve, is to receive our full flight pay from at least boarding, mm -hmm. and of course, including any flight time, because during boarding, that's the most stressful part of our job in, in many senses. It also, we're responsible for the safety and 
of our passengers. Uh, we have to be ready to evacuate an aircraft, deal with medical emergencies, all of that. So there is an argument to be made that we deserve that full flight pay from that for that boarding time, and that will be addressed in when we get to compensation. Um, so back to the two duty rates, we are proposing a change to the the one for two. We're proposing it a change to one uh, to one point five. The trip rate instead of one to three and a half, we're proposing one to three point two five. And that that trip rig is important because that prevents the company from extending laying you over for long periods of time without additional pay. If they lay you over for three, four or five days, at this, you know, without having to pay you that rig, you would just be paid for the flight time. This ensures that you know if they lay you for, lay you over for a long period of time, you are going to get that extra pay. Also, we're proposing a sit time rig. We hear from many members that they want the sit times reduced. The company has. Uh, reduce the sit times on many of the sequences. However, at times there are still trips out there with greater than two hours, three hours. Uh, the sit time ring that we're proposing would kick in after the two hour mark, which would guarantee a, an extra amount of pay on top of the value of the sequence. Um, this would at least kind of force the company, hopefully, to minimize those sit times. And we have to remember, though, that we can't completely eliminate sit time. If we if we do that, we hear from members that there's no time to get food. If there's too much sit time, then there, the complaints come in that there's too much sit time. So there's always going to be some bit of sit time on these multi leg sequences, but we're hoping to minimize that as much as we can. Also, we propose a change to how the duty day is calculated for standbys, and the company did agree to this change. Currently, your duty day on standby goes by the sequence that you're assigned. We have changed that to now that max duty day would go by the report time of your standby. We this is a good change. We're very pleased that they agreed to that. Um, we also proposed a change to the minimum day. We're proposing a 515 minimum per calendar day. This is what similar to what the pilots have. We do have to be careful though as with any change, especially to rigs, Without everything staying the same, the company is going to, you know, optimize things to, to their benefit as well. So currently a turn that crosses over midnight can still, you know, pay five, six hours. If we change the rates where it goes to, they have to pay 10 hours and 30 minutes to think that the company isn't going to fill up that extra time with some sort of additional fine, it, it, you know, they, they are going to try to burn off that stop time. So we know that. So we, we want to preserve um, we don't want to decimate the mid sheet by, by these changes, so we're very aware of that. Another change that we proposed and the company agreed to was how VE is paid and the maximums that go along with voluntary extension. Currently, there is no maximum when you volunteer to extend your duty day. The company agreed that they would to a maximum of four hours. Um, so on domestic, if you volunteer to extend your day and it went up to three hours over the maximum duty day, you would receive 200% for the value of the duty period. And then if you went over that three hour mark up to four hours, then it would be 300% paid for the duty period. We very pleased that that was agreed to. And one last thing we do want to mention, um, we also talk, we also proposed reducing the maximum duty day on domestic down to 14, as well as capping the number of legs on a domestic sequence to four per duty period. On the IPD side, you may have seen that the company proposed um, they want to change the layover rest after an IPD leg. Currently, the language says that after an IPD leg, you have a minimum of 14 hours. The company wants to be able to reduce that down to 10 hours in actual operations. That's a, a no-go from, from us, but we just did want to mention that because we've gotten a lot of feedback on that. I think that's about it for hours of service at this point. All right, thanks, Tim. All right, um, Wendy's going to talk. We've gotten quite a few questions about retirement and insurance. So, Wendy, let's talk a little bit about where we're at with that. So, yes, we did receive quite a few um, questions um, before the town hall about retirement um, and pensions. Currently, LUS and TWA are both um, pensions are in the PBGC. LAA's flight attendants had um, uh, our pensions frozen. And anybody hired after November of 2012, um, the contributions from the company for your 401k and everyone now has a 401k contribution of 
and a match of up to 2.5%. Um, this is part of economics, and this is something that we will be addressing with that, and it is part of our opening proposal to the company that's on the negotiations website on APFA, um, that we will be seeking an improvement to those uh, contributions and the matching. Um, some people said, you know, why can't we have what the pilots have? And we have to remember that um, every negotiations with different work groups make um, adjustments. They give up something to get something else. So we have to keep that in mind. They may have given up something to get more in that particular area. Um, we are not negotiating a buyout. Um, however, we are proposing that flight attendants have the option to convert sick and vacation time to a health retirement count account. Uh, if you choose to retire and you have a lot of sick time right now, it's uh, not valued very well. Uh, $8.65 if you retire with sick time is all they'll pay out to you. But we are looking to have that option to a health retirement account. And again, all of this stuff will be addressed in the economics once we get to that. And we're not quite there yet, almost. Great, thanks, Wendy. All right, next up, we're going to talk about electronic notifications. This contract we've had, um, we have a lot of our uh, sections that there's a lot of um, phone calls, right, to crew scheduling. And not everybody wants to sit on the phone with crew scheduling all day trying to get through. So, Brian, can you give them an update on kind of where we're at with um, when we say electronic notification, we're talking about two way communication only, right? <laughs> yeah, um, and as Julie noted, um, the electronic notification touches a large number of uh, sections and areas of the contract. Um, and as many of you said, you know, you, we hear from you that, you know, you don't want to have these conversations with scheduling at four in the morning. Um, so the electronic communication um, is an opportunity for us to alleviate that and give you that um, opportunity to um, not be woken up at the crack of dawn. Um, but within that said, um, similar to your conversations with scheduling where there is uh, recorded conversations, this will be a two way communications with the company. So um, uh, an example to that is uh, scheduling would send you a notification that you've received a trip. You would click on a verification um, indicator that you received that notification that would in turn go back to crew scheduling. They would in turn have to send you back a receipt uh, notification that they have received your, your acceptance. Um, this keeps a record um, at, at across the board of all communication with scheduling so that we can we can hold them accountable should there be any uh, 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 infractions or, or issues going forward with that. Um, so communication, uh, the electronic communication, like we said, it's a large section, uh, uh, a large portion of uh, sections within the uh, contract that will be um, covering it. But we just want to make sure that before we sign off on any of those, that uh, um, they're benefiting our membership um, to the fullest extent. There are items that we we have not agreed to um, under electronic notification because we feel that it's beneficial more to our membership that they do have direct contact with scheduling to ensure that that information is being uh, uh, provided to you and in detail. Um, other areas were were more open to accepting of that. Julie. Thanks, Brian. I know when I think about electronic notification, we have a couple that we've already agreed to. Mm -hmm. I'm in the company has agreed to, I should say, um, and that is deadheading for notification, Correct. right? Something that um, should be really easy to say, hey, I'm not taking that deadhead, I'm taking a different one, right? And then I believe also the VE, um, we've agreed to um, that, um, yes, we can agree the crew, right? The entire crew can agree um, to that um, via uh, electronic notification. Correct. So those are the two I am aware of that we've already agreed to. Um, we are going to be really careful in this section though um, as far as what we agree to. There are certain areas that we feel are really um, feel very strongly that still need to remain as positive contact, um, meaning a phone call. But hopefully what will happen here is is that with you know uh, let's say half of our uh, notifications become electronic that you won't be sitting on hold with crew schedule for hours trying to get through um, that really is a waste of everyone's time and we want to make sure that um, you know your time is very valuable um, when you are um, working and not working so um, we'll be very careful with how we agree to those all right susan you're up next um section 15 foreign language speakers you probably remember has been TA'd and we just want to clear up any confusion that 
the intent of the change of the language was not to reduce the total number of speakers on board the aircraft. The change in the language is going to honor seniority for all flight attendants, speakers and non-speakers on those trips where cabin positions will be awarded according to seniority. So there seems to be some confusion on that. We just want to be clear on that. Um, other parts of the contract touch on improvements for foreign language speaker. Um, I don't know if Reese spoke to it, but there'll be um, a search criteria option for speakers in PBS where you can sort out specific speaker trips. We don't have that. When we get to compensation, we are of course looking for an increase in speaker pay. Uh, we are looking also for um, an understaffing uh, pay for speakers um, as well. So there are other improvements coming uh, to that. Since we've TA'd that section, the company has announced that they will be retrofitting some of our aircraft and the three class service will be going away. So we will be revisiting section 15, just making sure we're um, taking into account the uh, changes, aircraft changes that are coming. That's it. Okay, thanks Susan. Thanks. All right, uh, so let's get to some questions. I know we answered a lot of them with just the um, update. So um, the ones that we haven't answered, we're going to kind of go through here. And um, the first question up, it looks like Brian, you're going to take that one. Uh, yes, um, is the union discussing boarding pay with American Airlines? Our GDs while boarding have increased and flight attendants should get paid while boarding. Boarding is the busiest phase of the flight. Um, that is something that we are proposing to the company. Um, we are reviewing uh, with um, Joe and uh, looking at other carriers who have already um, instituted it and have also made those proposals within their uh, negotiated uh, contract discussions. Um, with that said, that will be done through our uh, um, compensation, uh, which is uh, due to come um, in discussions. So uh, that is uh, definitely something that we are looking at and uh, will propose at that time. All right, thanks, Brian. OK, I believe the next question up is going to be um, Wendy. Um, what is being done to improve the 401k uh, percent match? Top age group went from 9.9 .9 to 5%. I understand two work groups, however, don't pilots receive 16%. Um, yes, we are going to be in, uh, looking to increase that 401k match. And yeah, the pilots do receive 16%. However, like I said, the sometimes what's negotiated, you know, they give up something to get something and um, we don't know what that was for them. Thanks, Wendy. All right, next up is Reese. OK, um, bidding for trips out of base. Where does this stand? For instance, I'm a speaker and I would like to fly a trip out of New York that is missing a speaker. So as I talked about in our UBL improvements, um, we are proposing out of base UBL. So if you are that speaker looking to fly a trip out of New York that is missing a speaker, you would just go on to the New York UBL and um, put in your bid for it. And if you were the most senior person, you would get it awarded to you and hopefully you live in New York. So you would be able to um, get there. Uh, I see that you're based in Philly, so um, if you live in Philly, you would just have to get yourself to New York um, some other way. Great. Thanks, Grace. Mm -hmm. OK, next up is mine. Every other union I have been a member of holds off-site meetings throughout negotiations to gain a clear understanding of what specific outcomes the membership desires. Why are you neglecting that responsibility? OK, so I just want to explain we did um, as far as for this negotiations, we had three surveys that had been done um, and it was sent out to the entire membership. There were also base meetings um, that were done prior to COVID and then after COVID, everything has pretty much been virtual. So we've done town halls. We also have uh, negotiations membership feedback that we would love for you to send in um, your emails. We know we are getting a lot of those and then um, Pretty much um, most of the information that we have been using has been from those surveys, those previous base visits, our emails that come in from our flight attendants, and then of course all the town halls that we've done. So I um, just wanted to kind of let you know what we have done uh, for this negotiations. Susan, you're up next. 
I value having one speaker position on our IPD flights. Any consideration to having one per flight instead of one per class? Um, as I just spoke to um, uh, the T8 section, we are not, uh, our proposal does not reduce the total number of speakers on board the aircraft, and your cabin position would be determined by your seniority. All right, thanks, Susan. Wendy, you're up next. Why does the company want to start using line holders as a backup reserve system? I hope APFA doesn't allow this. This is what reserves are for. Uh, we are not interested in having line holders used as reserves. Um, we are holding firm on that. Um, the company wants to be able to switch that. They propose that and we are not interested. Thanks, Wendy. All right, that was hard fought language. Um, Tim, you're up next. How possible is it to have the wrap periods um, reserve reduced from 12 hours to eight hours per day? Sitting at home from 12 hours is very ridiculous. Um, first of all, anything is possible. However, uh, we do have a strong mandate from the membership as well as the vice presidents that we want the people want the reserve numbers lowered. Um, as you know, LAA used to have 24 hours periods of wrap, uh, basically 24 hour periods of availability. LUS had 12. Um, now everybody's at 12. We did see an increase to the number of reserves when we changed to this and going to a shorter wrap period would just increase that further. So there is no plan to go to a shorter uh, wrap period from the 12 to current. Thanks, Tim. All right, Brian. Um, why is only one Hindi speaker being assigned on flights to Delhi? Uh, this, uh, in spite of having enough uh, number of speakers in the New York base. Um, currently, the JCB language allows up to one uh, per class of service, allowing AA to place up to two um, speakers on a flight. Um, keep in mind that uh, when placing the speakers on there, there is no designated number within the base that then requires the company to alter the number of flight attendants uh, or speakers that go on to a flight in particular. Um, also keep in mind that when um, we're looking at the numbers that are uh, of speakers on there, the uh, speaker, once they rotate into reserve, are no longer speaker designated solely for that language. They, are, they can be used for any flight or any trip um, that is available. So once the, um, a number of speakers fall into the reserve rotation um, in our own reserve, they can be utilized domestically and for other avenues um, outside of their language potentially, uh, which could shorten the number of speakers available. All right, thanks, Brian. Mm -hmm. Okay, I have another question for Brian. Then I'll read it regarding unpaid medical leaves and the twelve months <clears throat> that the company keeps us under active uh, benefit rates. After twelve months, the company no longer pays their portion of our health benefits, and we switch to the ridiculous expensive COBRA rates. Correct? Has there been any movement on extending the twelve month clock to twenty four or thirty six months? Yes, um, we are actually proposing to the company um, a thirty six month. Uh, um, uh, valuation for that, both in for uh, not only the medical, but in IOD. Um, so both both areas of that have been proposed. The company, uh, as you've noted, um, is 12 months at the moment, but we are um, we've made that proposal to 36 months. We think it's we believe that it is the better option and would be benefits to our flight attendants uh, much greater than the current process. It's one of our items that is still open in that side. That is correct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, Greece. All right, uh, why are we seeking improvements in obscure areas of our contract? After all, this is a job and the purpose of a job is to make money. I think we need to focus on the important item, compensation. We are being sidetracked by the small stuff. So um, as Joe went over in uh, his bit at the beginning, um, this we are getting to compensation. It is the last section that we negotiate and um, it is very important, of course. But um, ultimately, compensation is a pool of money that um, gets decided and then we just divvy it up. So it is important, but it's also um, the last thing that we do because 
although it may seem obscure, um, all of the other sections of the contract are also really important because that's what you do every day. So as I went through in my very long spiel about scheduling, um, it may seem obscure to you, but that's how you bid for your trips. That's how you trade your trips. That's how you, if there's a storm, get rescheduled for your trips. Um, as Wendy talked about, the company is proposing uh, to treat line holders as reserves. So it might seem obscure, but it's actually really important that we hold on to the language that has been negotiated because we don't want line holders to start being treated as reserves. Um, similarly, like Brian just talked about with um, COBRA rates, it might seem like that's not important. Maybe you've never been in that position, but um, for somebody that has, it's really important for them to be able to get um, their medical care taken care of for as long as, as possible. So. Um, because this is targeted negotiations, we are going through um, and starting with everything else, and then we'll get to compensation. And so that should be happening um, shortly, but uh, we wanted to make sure everything else could be agreed to that could be agreed to or tabled that needed to be tabled um, before we got to that last area. Thanks, Teresa. Mm -hmm. I would say this. I, I know for myself, um, being out talking to the flight attendants, um, I know from the base visits that were done prior to COVID, um, reserve, and we heard quite a bit of um, back then, reserve needed improvements, and we definitely could not ignore reserve. And we also heard quite a bit that we need better flexibility, so, right? We need yep. a better work-life balance here. And so that is definitely all part of this contract, and that is what we are seeking um, in our negotiations. All right, next, is there something we can do that is more effective than picketing? Um, well, absolutely, picketing is very effective. Um, we will be doing other uh, action items. We have done a few, uh, and we hope that every flight attendant will join us when we ask you to send an email. That's an action item telling the company um, that you're not happy with something and sending it to the right person. We've done a few action items. One was to our manpower planning team, and that was based uh, basically about our um, the trip construction about our reserve percentages right and it that is another part of um letting the company know what um is important to you we will also be sending uh putting a poll on our website um, i believe it will go out tomorrow so please look for that on our new website and we will start using polling also so that we can get um more information from you and that will be very helpful. Also, make sure you always wear your pin every time you go to work on your uh, on the outside of your uniform so that it can be seen and the red lanyards. Um, it's really important that you participate in everything that I just mentioned. Um, all of those are really important um, at this time, and that does let the company know where you stand as far as um, how you feel about what's being um, negotiated and also about um, how, how your work is today. Uh, Julie, can I add in there? Absolutely. Yeah, so, you know, I hear that from time to time that picketing's not a, not effective, but you know, a lot of times if you think about it, if you just pick it once in a while, like one time, the company doesn't really care. But how we're viewing it is, and I've done this over and over again, it's part of a comprehensive campaign. So you got to look at the picketing as one component of a multi-pronged pressure uh, plan to pressure the company, and the picketing is very important. So when we're, you know, like at Hawaiian Airlines. You know, the flight attendants were out in mass and they were picketing month after month combined with a 2400 to one strike vote. It gets all in the media. Then you start getting it in the media. Passengers start getting concerned about booking on the carrier and so forth, even though we're not at this point, you know, in, in, you know, saying that because we can't. But but it just happens. So, um, you know, so picketing is like a crucial part. And even if we have to pick it month after month, it's something that builds and it gets it into the board of directors and the media and so forth. So, um, you know, it, it's your part in negotiations, one of the many parts you have, but it's an important part. So uh, don't think it's not important. Thank you, Joe. I appreciate that. OK, um, well, I know today we um, we've gone over our hour. Um, thank you for staying with us.
Uh, we're really happy to see all of you on. We have a few reminders um, before you leave us. One is please join us at the picketing event on January 24th, which is next Tuesday. Make sure um, you can check it out on uh, Instagram. If you're not, uh, haven't joined APFA Unity on Instagram, please do. We keep that up to date um, and we give you all kinds of information through uh, the APFA Unity page on Instagram. Please always remember to wear your Unipin when you go to work. Uh, and please stay informed by reading the hotlines, going to the website, watching the town halls if you're unable to join. We are going to do a town hall probably every month from this point forward. So our next town hall will be in February. And um, what else am I missing? You're missing uh, the oh. gentle, supposed to be a gentle reminder you, regarding <laughs> your due status, but I think it needs to be a firm reminder. Uh, right now, we have about 25% of our members who are in dues arrears, which means they cannot vote. And when we come to the point, if we're taking a strike vote, we need all hands on deck. And like Joe said, we need 25,000 ready to kick down the front door. So please, it's easier than ever on the new APFA website to check your due status. Please talk to your fellow crew members about it. There are so many members who owe $20 or less that can be taken care of very quickly with a credit card. Why would you throw away your vote? We just are, we're coming up on base elections as well. And uh, what's the balloting period? 30 days? Yeah. 25% of our members won't be able to vote in base elections. That's just, um, it's not acceptable. So let I know Eric Harris, our treasurer, is working very hard with his department to um, get us in better financial shape and get our dues in order. But please um, help us with that by talking to your fellow flight attendants uh, when you're at work. We, we need everyone dues current and able to vote. And it's easier than ever to check easier your account. Mm -hmm. Just go to the APFA website. Up in the yeah. top right hand corner, it says my account and you can pay it right there. It's yeah. very easy and there are a lot that are $20 in arrears. And yeah. really, when you think that you're giving up your vote on your base elections, your strike vote, mm -hmm. your um, TA, that's a lot that you're giving up for $20. So please um, get current. All right. And make sure tomorrow, right? We're hoping it'll be out tomorrow, Josh, right? on the poll. Yep. Uh, we're going to put our first poll out on our website, so please check it out. Um, check out the new website. Also, we have a lot of information on there. Um, it's changed entirely. Uh, the on the job page is my favorite page. It'll tell you everything you want to know about uh, reserve, that heading, pay protections, rescheduling, so make sure you check that out. And thank you very much for joining us today. We really appreciate your time. And um, we'll see you next uh, next month for our next town hall. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you.